good enough to be joined with our good friend from uh, USA Today, Steve Gardner, on the Boardwalk on the Hotline to uh, uh, maybe walk me off the ledge a little bit, but more importantly, to preview uh, the AL and the NLCS. How you been, pal? I'm good, Rich. How are you? Uh, I feel like Not a so good, huh? no. I'm you know <laughs> I I I had a couple of bad moments yesterday on the air, um, but that typically happens. Um, I, I just I, I can't I, I can't stand the manager. And it's not after the fact and it's not Monday morning quarterbacking. We had this discussion. You know I was the biggest Girardi fan. I was not enamored or impressed with the hiring of Boone and I knew, I just knew there was gonna be a moment where um, his decision making or lack thereof was gonna cost his team. Now look, the Red Sox were the better team. No one's disputing that. But I mean, you gotta know when your starters don't have it. You have to. Yeah, I think one of the things that managers have to do, and then, you know, not to wax nostalgic for the uh, the good old days, but managers in in previous years where they didn't have so many, you know, locker room responsibilities and and media responsibilities and all that, they were in tune with being able to look ahead several batters in advance and plan strategically for the moves that they needed to make because that was that was their primary job and I think with with Aaron Boone it it sort of caught up to him a little quickly didn't have time to get guys warmed up when he probably should have and you know this is his first real playoff situation as a manager and things are different in the regular season and when they're in the postseason. And uh, in the regular season, you can kind of ride your starter a little bit because you've got 161 other games that you're playing. But in the postseason, it's do or die, and everything is just magnified. You've got to make, you know, pre, uh, you've got to, you've got to expect things ahead of time and, and make those preemptive moves, and he didn't do it. Do you think the Yankees are covering up uh, for the uh, Severino blunder because it just doesn't make sense. And I, I watched the game, and I listened to Darling, and then I listened to Flattery on the Yes Network afterwards, and I agree 100%. I mean, these guys lived it. They know it. I don't understand how you're warming up at 732 when first pitch is 740. I mean, to me, that's a total lapse. Yeah, it, I, I think you're right. And um, obviously, if you come out and say that, it sounds like an excuse, and it makes you look bad for not being, again, not being prepared for uh, you know, the postseason and everything that goes on there. Um, it, it probably did happen the way that Ron Darling talked about, and I don't know that, you know, Severino got away with an awful lot in that first inning, an awful lot of hard-hit balls, but once you get into the game, you've done your warm-ups, you've gotten through the first inning, he should be able to settle down, and he just it didn't seem like he was completely right all the game long, and uh, that's where you have to be ready to make the change. Uh, I'll tell you what. I thought if the Yankees were able to get another push, another run across, they had Kimbrell exactly where they wanted. We were going to get a game five. It's not the case, and at the end of the day, the bats went silent. Listen, you have Stanton. He's an, a former NL MVP. We know he's a slugger, but it's amazing what happens when – you go from, and we talk about this all the time, right? Sometimes the bright lights, you go from playing in an area or a team or a city or a part of the country that no one really pays attention to, and you're putting on monster numbers, and then you go to a big market, whether it's Chicago, D.C., L.A., or New York, you have to perform in the postseason. I thought he could have had a signature at bat in moment, and he disappointed. I mean, the bats just, offensively, they disappointed. Yeah, and it, it's easy to point to that at bat. You know, Stanton goes deep there, and what we're tied, and then the place is going nuts. But nobody on the Yankees hit for either of those games. The team that led the majors in home runs set a record for uh, Major League Baseball for home runs as a team in the season, and have one of the best home run hitting parks in all of the majors. And you don't hit any home runs the two games that you play there. You you can put that on Stanton, sure, but it's got to go on everybody else that didn't contribute offensively. It was it was definitely a collective team effort. And you know, one rally in the ninth inning in the last game of the uh, of the series, it just wasn't enough. Uh, I look at Alex Cora and, and I like him. I think he's got a little bit of an edge to him. I mean, I listened to some of his comments that he talked about with Judge and the blasting of the music, and he's a young guy and he's a great player, and the way he handles his staff and the way, you know, we always talk about players taking on the personality of their manager. There, there's a little bit of an edge to um, uh, Alex Cora. 
I th- and I think you saw that in the eighth inning of Game Four, where he brought in Chris Sale. I mean, yeah. that's a a classic go for the jugular move right there because the safety net, if something happens and he doesn't have it, you know, we saw Max Scherzer, for instance, for the Washington Nationals last year, come in in the deciding Game Five against the Cubs in the division series, and you know, he gave up uh, the the lead and and. You know, the Nationals were out. So the safety net was gone. If Sale didn't perform or if Kimbrell blew the save, what were they going to do in game? We'll never know. But uh, certainly Alex Cora was aggressive, and I think that's what you've got to be in the postseason. Nah, listen, he had uh, Porcello in relief in the eighth in game one, right? And then he started Brock Holt in game three. Mm-hmm. And all this kid does <laughs> is have his first player in postseason history to hit for the cycle. I mean, I, I don't like the matchup for them against Houston. I, I, I just don't. I, I just think Houston, offensively, they're a juggernaut, and it goes back to the starting rotation and the pen, and I trust their starters and the pen more than I trust the Boston Red Sox bullpen. And I don't know how you match I them run too. for run. Yeah, I, I do too. And I think the, the key here for Boston is, can David Price actually be the pitcher in the postseason that he was in the regular season? Because he's never won a postseason game in which he was the starting pitcher. So he's got that to prove. And you've got Houston with Verlander and Garrett Cole, a solid one-two. The Red Sox have to match those two guys with Sale and Price. And uh, if they don't do that, I think that's where you could see the series tilt because Verlander is just so good in the postseason and Cole was outstanding in his start. I think, yeah, the Astros have the advantage in starting pitching. I think they have it in the bullpen. And uh, offense could be a toss-up, and that's one of those cases where you you just don't know who's going to be the hero on any given night. Uh, the LCS uh, umpiring assignments are out, so the NLCS crew chief will be uh, Jerry Davis. ALCS gets Joe West. I was just trying to look here real quick. I don't see Angel Hernandez. I'm just going down <laughs> Uh, all right, I don't see anything. Um, all We've right, been the, spared. Yeah, <laughs> you know, CC needs to shut up too. First of all, does he realize that Angel Hernandez is suing MLB? That's number one. Second of all, you don't need to make those comments because, to be fair, and this is coming from me now, so you know I'm being honest. That mm-hmm. the Yankees, I mean, Boston got squeezed on a couple pitches as well with some of these Yankees at bat. So CC just he didn't have it the other night. That's it. You move on. Now he listen. You needed him to give you five. He's shown the track record of doing it. He didn't have his stuff the other night. Yeah, I think that's that's pretty plain and simple. And I, I don't know that you could have expected him or, or uh, felt that he could give you five good innings. And, and that, that they really needed him to. I mean, with you've got the best bullpen in all of Major League Baseball. You should be using it. And, and CeCe Sabathia shouldn't be. You know, the first sign of trouble – get the bullpen up and get those guys in there. Uh, that's that's the way you manage in postseason. And, yeah, for CeCe, it's one of those it's, – it's not a great look for him, uh, what could be his last uh, start as a Yankee. But it's one of those where – the, the umpiring was, I, I thought, was was equally bad on, on both sides, and you didn't hear Porcello complaining at all. How about this? The Astros are hyper-focused on analytics, right? And then the Brewers hired their GM from the Astros. I mean, are we starting – go ahead, I'm sorry. No, I, I think we're, we are seeing yeah. a wave. You know, the Dodgers are very heavily yep. into yep. analytics as well, and, um, and the Red Sox have Bill James, for goodness sake, as a member of their front office. So it's one of those – I think it's it's slowly taking over to the point where maybe not um, do, do completely you... taking over, but it's it's a mix. We now, we are now seeing a good mix between the scouts and the numbers. I, I want to move on from the Yankees, and I want to get into the NLCS. But I'm just curious: Do you think there's an over reliance um, of analytics? And it, it, did it did it cost a team like the Yankees, or do you think in baseball, as you said, that's just gonna? And the reason I bring it up is because in our backyard, that's that's who Gabe Kapler is. I mean, yeah. it's almost like yeah. I'm, this is this is the game plan. Here's my analytics. It's laid out. I'm not going to deviate from that. Well, I think you know if if Aaron Boone is going, uh, you know, specifically analytically. He's definitely got his bullpen up and ready to go. You, you know, that's that's more of the old school of sticking with my starter and, and letting him go and hoping he gets through the fourth inning. You know, hope is definitely not a word that is in an analytic, uh, an analytically minded executive's vocabulary. And uh, so, no, I think that 
the front office has has things down, and I think Aaron Boone is is comfortable with the analytics, but just the application of it. Um, you've you've got to be able to you know when to trust yep. your gut and when to trust the numbers and certainly the numbers said that he should have moved a lot quicker than he did. Yep, yep. I, and like you said, the Red Sox who still employ uh, Bill James to this day. I mean, it's I, I don't know. To me, it's like cooking, right? I mean, it's everyone can cook to some extent. Some people are better at it than others. I mean, it's just and you do have to have a gut feel at the end of the day. And that's something I've noticed too. You know, when you look at the NLCS, you have. Uh, these two types of managers, these two types of teams, um, you know, I think there's pressure on the Dodgers. I do, because everything with the Dodgers is you have this type of season, uh, you know, you have uh, this type of starting rotation, you've got a, a, a Hall of Famer, you've got a very good lineup. Obviously, you go out and you acquire the big bopper. You, there's a reason that you did what you did. You know, you have to find a way to beat the Milwaukee Brewers, get back to the World Series, because anything less would be a disappointment. And then conversely, to me, we talked about this. Milwaukee's sneaky good. I think they're playing with house money, and I would not be shocked if they beat the Dodgers. Now, I don't think it's going to be a sweep, but I can see the series going seven. I can too, and um, I I lean toward Milwaukee, but you're right. The pressure, I think, is on the Dodgers because they got so close last year, and Clayton Kershaw could opt out of his contract too at the end of the season. And you think about what the Dodgers would be without him, then it's it's a whole different story. And uh, so, yeah, they got Manny Machado for for the uh, for the stretch run. And they're all in, certainly for this season. And and I do think the pressure is on them. While Milwaukee kind of, uh, you know, jumped up and and became an elite team pretty quickly with a couple of those those off season signings and possibly the uh, the NL MVP. So, yeah, I, I do. I agree with you. The Brewers are uh, they should feel like they're playing with house money right now. And I I think I give them a slight edge because of their bullpen. I mean, exactly. to, I mean, listen. You get to the World Series with your starting rotation, your starting pitching staff, but a lot of times you win it because of the pen. And I look at their pen yeah. right now, and you know, we, we, against Colorado, they use a traditional starter. Um, I think it was for two games, right? They did it. They used the bullpen a lot during the regular season. I think they had 614 mm-hmm. relief innings, which was second most in the NL. The Padres pitch more relief uh, innings. And we know San Diego is a bad team with an effect of starters. But M- Milwaukee, I mean, it's just, again, I-, I like their thinking, right? I like how Council is thinking. Okay, this is what we're going to do. We're going to go with, um, I'm trying to think who they went with. It was uh, Woodruff. Yes. Was in game one. Yes, yes. And he gave them three per- perfect innings. Didn't allow a hit in three innings. So, I mean, that's, that is taking the, uh, you know, the analytic road and to the extreme and it worked out perfectly for them. Four different relievers in all three games. I, I mean, that's yeah. Um, uh, real quick, when, when you've got uh, Josh Hader in the, yes. at the back of that as as the wild card who can go a couple innings, I think that's that's a huge weapon in the postseason. Uh, Steve, two more before I let you get out of here. And again, Steve Gardner does a great job covering baseball. USA Today, wonderful writer. Follow him on Twitter. Always kind enough to join us during the baseball season on the Boardwalk on the Hotline. I want to go back to the AL real quick. How how disappointing. Um, would you uh, would you feel if you're an Indians fan? Because it seems as though every year, you know, they've got the offense, but we get on the Yankees for their bats going silent. The same thing could be said with um, the Cleveland Indians. The guys that were supposed to step up did not produce in the postseason again. Yeah, it, and that's tough because this was this was a team that certainly had the starting pitching to go very deep into the uh, into the playoffs, and yet. There were still an awful lot of holes. They were starting, you know, Melky Cabrera in in right field and starting Jason Kipnis in center field. I mean, this, it, it, although they did trade for Josh Donaldson, still the, the lineup just didn't compare with the Red Sox and the Astros. And I think maybe in in another year where we didn't have these super teams from the AL, the Indians could have been you know, possible playoff contenders and World Series contenders. I even thought they had a chance to make it to the World Series, but the Astros were just too tough. And I think that's one of the things, if you're a Cleveland fan, that you know you've got that pitching staff to uh, to anchor you next season. Um, I think there's still some things they can do in the offseason to improve the offense and get right back to the playoffs and, and be a contender as well. So I, I think things are still, though they may be disappointed in uh, 2018, 
things are bright in 2019 for Cleveland. Uh, more appealing destination uh, uh, job-wise for a GM, would it be the Mets or would it be the O's? Wow. Um, I would – you know, it, it really depends on – when you talk to the people in the front office and what their philosophy is to to spend money to get better because you need to do that in both locations you've got an awful lot of competition certainly in the american league east for baltimore there's an awful lot of competition there with the red sox and yankees always good um with the mets i think it's a big question of 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 what kind of commitment are you going to get i think that's the big question for anybody that interviews for that gm job because if the Mets, you know, they have the financial uh, ability to go out and spend money, or that at least they should, and, you know, this is the number one market in all of America, you ought to be able to go in and be a player for those big free agents and, and be able to fix the team. You've got to have that commitment from the front office. And uh, I think the Mets probably are a better job right now. The, the rebuilding possibilities are much better in New York than they are in Baltimore. But... Um, Still, you've got to convince me that uh, ownership is on board before I take that job. Would you agree, too, less pressure in Baltimore than in New York? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, the Orioles have been, you know, the Orioles have been really good for, for a decade until this season, and they sort of, uh, you know, when everything fell out. Um, so, yeah, you've got a fan base that certainly uh, supports the team, especially when things are going well. Um, you've got a great ballpark, probably the best in all of Major League Baseball. So, yeah, the pressure to win immediately, probably not as much in Baltimore. All right, 20 seconds before I let you get out of here. Um, give me your predictions, NLCS, ALCS. Who's going to be playing in the World Series? I think uh, in the NL, the Brewers are going to come out of it. It's going to be a, a hard-fought series, maybe six games, Milwaukee. And um, I think it's such a toss-up, but I'm leaning toward the Astros in seven in the AL. So, we get a Houston Milwaukee World Series. Wow. So you're uh, throwing it back to the good old days, right? Kevin Bass, Cecil Cooper, Molitor, <laughs> Robin Yount. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. What? Ned Yost was the, uh, one of the catchers Harvey's on that team with bag. Harry's Walls. Didn't they? They came. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. They had a unbelievable. Didn't they have a ridiculous start that year? They won like 13, 14, or 15 in a row to start the season. I know they had a great. And that was the old yeah. AL East, right? That's when you That's had right, the Brewers, exactly. the O's. Stop me when I'm wrong. The, the Red Tigers, Sox, the yeah. Tigers, the Indians, the Yanks, and the Blue Jays. Mm-hmm. Wow. Harvey's Walls, man. That's a, that's a nice pull by you. <laughs> All right, listen. Fanta- good yeah, fantastic. Uh, enjoy the games. We'll talk next week, and we'll be uh, we'll be engrossed with these uh, championship uh, league championships here. As always, appreciate a couple moments, bud. Thanks so much, Rich.